Uh, so first of all, uh, I, I want to thank everyone for uh, coming out and joining us tonight. And uh, those of you who are you know, viewing us uh, over the internet, thank you also for joining. Uh, we are here, uh, Hodinki and uh, of course Omega, uh, to celebrate 60 years of uh, probably the single most remarkable wristwatch um, in the history of wristwatches, uh, a watch with an unparalleled uh, history, uh, the Omega Speedmaster. And uh, we're here tonight uh, with uh, Mr. Petros Protopapas, who is the Heritage Director for Omega, and uh, who has one of the most phenomenal memories that I've ever encountered in my life. I think he has not forgotten a single thing he's ever heard about uh, the Speedmaster, or for that matter, anything else. So, you know, in six decades, the Speedmaster has accumulated an absolutely phenomenal history. We all know its history of use in manned space flight uh, and uh, elsewhere. And uh, tonight, since we have to focus on uh, you know, just a, a few things, because the whole story is far too big to tell in uh, one evening or even, uh, you know, even days, um, Petros has been kind enough to bring three watches that represent some really, truly fascinating aspects of the history of the Speedmaster. And uh, we're going to jump right in uh, with the first one, which is uh, the reference 2998. And um, I'd like to ask you, Petros, so with so many possible choices to make and with all of the resources of uh, the Omega Museum and Omega's history uh, and the Speedmaster's history, why this particular reference? Uh, why, why, did, why, did, why was it one of the three? Quite easy. Thank you, Jack. Um, the 2998 uh, was the watch, was the model that transitioned the Speedmaster from the classic legendary uh, 2915, mm -hmm. which was a racing car driver's favorite, it transitioned it into something completely different. It transitioned it into a pilot's favorite, into a doctor's favorite, and obviously also into something that almost went out of this world. Right. The 2998 became a, <coughs> a pilot's favorite, or a military pilot's favorite at first. So I'm sorry, the, the very first series of 2998, the very first, they, they yes. were delivered to the Peru Exactly. So it actually was a pilot's watch. If you want to call, I mean, to a pilot, this watch is a perfect pilot's watch. Black dial, contrast, I mean, there, there, there can't be a better pilot's watch than the one that you can actually read all the time. It's very important. Now, the idea of, 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 of this for Peru, it means um, military pilots need clear readability. So we had one small change made to this model onto the central second hand, the tip of it. It had a round, round ball. Hence, collectors call it the lollipop. At the same time, the 2998 uh, became, because it was a pilot's favorite, and because American Mercury astronauts, as probably most of us here know, um, they were military pilots, test pilots. And um, they needed watches, they needed cameras, they needed all kinds of things for the space program. And at the time, the company, well, the people that ran the program, their bosses, um, they didn't give them what they needed as far as regular consumables are concerned. But there is a third astronaut of the Mercury program that also chose privately a 2998. So if you ask me uh, or ask Omega why the 2998, it's the watch that changed everything. So this is really, um, <clears throat> it's a fascinating story and it really kind of reflects a little bit the improvisational sort of bootstrap nature of early manned space flight. You know, uh, the race to get men into space was a, a extremely competitive and uh, it was not as if you could go around and buy space stuff from people who had been making space stuff <laughs> for, you know, 20 or 30 years. Uh, so you, you, you picked uh, the right tool for the job or as close as you could get from existing products that were out there. So we have this remarkable, a really remarkable fact of a wristwatch that was obviously, you know, nobody sat down with a blank sheet of paper and said, let's design a watch for manned spaceflight, but it turned out to be the best tool for the job. It's true. And for us, it became really the first Omega in space mm -hmm. as a private tool, as a private choice, which then literally woke up NASA to bigger things as far as watches are concerned mm -hmm. and cameras mm -hmm. and led to the testing phase, but that's another story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. So the uh, the two nine nine eight it was uh, produced in uh, uh, what in what numbers? Oh, the numbers. Ooh. <laughs> um, I wouldn't want to be quoted on this one because the numbers, the the production the production numbers of the movements are still sometimes even for us at the museum. Although we have all kinds of papers, yeah. they still hold some mysteries. Um, we have come quite close. To, to get a number, but I wouldn't be the one that 
but wants to be quoted on that. But, but, you know, but again, even a, a certain degree of imprecision in this is, you know, it's part of the nature of a watch being made to be used, being made as a tool and not something that was originally conceived of as, you know, you didn't keep track of every single reference number or serial number because there was no notion that collectors would, that this would become, uh, you know, collectible. I mean, we did actually, at Omega, we're very proud that we have mm. an incredible array of archives uh, and nothing was destroyed. Although we lost a few things in, 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 in things like uh, fires and floods and things like that. And that's the problem. The problem is that, especially within our most legendary watch model, that we cannot always trace its history as far as production records are concerned, simply because we're missing pages, literally. And we're missing pages on the 2915, we're missing pages on the 2998, and we're missing pages on the 10503, which is the tested one, which is the saddest thing to admit, um, but we have to be honest about this. Mm -hmm. Hence, I'm really not in the position to, I mean, we can estimate or guesstimate by the, by the thousands, or by, in this case, by, like, by a couple of thousands. Sure. Um, it wasn't a huge production, but it wasn't a limited edition. Yeah, of course, of course. However, speaking of limited editions, you've handed me the <laughs> segue to the next watch, um, which is, uh, in, in a sense, we could almost call it the first uh, Speedmaster limited edition, I think. This is totally correct, and thank you for saying this, because now we talk about, um, yeah, it's the gold edition, of the moon watch. It's the BA 145-022 or 022. And it has a very, sp very specific meaning to Omega because we've skipped by now the NASA testing, we've skipped the moon landing, we've skipped everything because, yeah, I think we know about this. At least we should know about this. And we are after the success. And in order to commemorate and celebrate the success of the moon landing, we at Omega had a beautiful thought. And we conceived this model is literally our very first limited edition in brackets. Yeah, I'd like not to handle it like this. So I need free hands to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we conceived the idea that all the active members of the astronaut corps of NASA at the time, and all the future astronauts that have not yet flown but were selected, as well as the president of the United States and his vice president, as well as certain heads, uh, top management, at NASA would receive this watch as a, as a gift of appreciation for everything that was done uh, basically for the advancement of humanity, of, of, of humankind. And um, during a gala dinner in Houston at the Warwick Hotel in November 69, all the active astronauts received an invitation, NASA personnel received an invitation, and yes, once again, the White House received an invitation. Mm -hmm. The problem is we produced these pieces, we engraved these pieces with the respective names. And what we are having, I'm touching it again, what we're having here, and I hope we can shoot some close-ups later, on the case back, we have the engraving of the name of the Vice President of the United States, Spirit Agnew, at the time. But because the President, friendly, in a friendly manner, declined because they were not supposed to receive expensive gifts. Sure. The vice president also declined. The astronauts were in parts, I have to say, because they're, I mean, they're state employees. So it, it's not an evident thing that an astronaut would accept such, such a gift. Sure. And a few of them also did not feel very safe at saying yes. Later on, they sent us letters and we have always, we fulfilled the promise. So Omega said that every active astronaut of the Apollo program and the Gemini program will receive his watch, and this is exactly what we did in the end, because this dragged on until 1972. Ooh. So there was, there was a, in, well, of course, the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the uh, president and vice president uh, politely declined mm -hmm. uh, to receive the watches for obvious reasons, um, and several of the astronauts did initially, but they were uh, sort of persuaded to uh, accept the... I wouldn't say persuaded, certainly not from us. Yeah. I think every astronaut that, for example, didn't receive it because they hadn't yet flown yet, for example, oh. I mean, the moment you have, I mean, imagine you're an astronaut and the, the Speedmaster is probably the single most, no, like, close to normality object that you have up there, you have on the moon, you, you have with you that reminds you of everything that's important. It reminds you of home, it reminds you of your home time, it reminds you of your family. So every single astronaut that flew later Personally, I would, I would incline to, 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 to believe that, yeah, it's normal right, that they right. would all 
want to receive this commemorative edition because they flew with this watch, they flew with the Speedmaster. So to take it before actually flying would have been, uh, so to speak, uh, bad luck. It, yeah, because a lot of a lot of astronauts actually believed in luck. They have mascots and, 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 and lucky charms and things like that. So it might have been a, luck, a bad luck, or they might not yet have come to a, yeah, I don't know, to appreciate what this watch might mean to them in the future. So and it's quite interesting. So these watches were actually produced and engraved uh, before it was clear whether or not the recipients would be able to actually accept them. That's correct. And mm -hmm. originally, roughly, uh, originally 28 pieces mm -hmm. with specific engravements. And all together of this edition, we made 1,014 pieces. And the rest, I would say, that we did not go to the astronauts or to NASA officials, was sold to the public with a beautiful case back. And it's a, it's a wonderful play of colors that you have with this, with the burgundy, with the burgundy bezel replacing the black anodized aluminum. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful speed master. So just, the, just these, these two watches really uh, together, the 2998 and the gold, <coughs> excuse me, the gold Spiro Agnew, they actually represent sort of two poles of the presence mm -hmm. of the Speedmaster. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, we have the 2998, which represents the astronauts selecting for themselves the, the right tool for the job, the best tool for the job at the very, very early, day, early days. Uh, and then we have the gold Spiro Agnew, which is one of the watches that represents the, the triumph of the space program and sort of a, a high, it's a commemoration, you could say, of a, a, a real high point in manned space flight, which we, uh, you know, struggle to return to. Yeah, absolutely true. And, and uh, so on a personal note, I, 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 can, I can say that really I hope that we will get back there because that's exactly what we need. The whole well, planet needs it. Yeah, yeah. So um, the third watch, speaking of going back, uh, <laughs> was designed to fulfill, was actually designed to fulfill a particular role in manned space flight. Uh, and there was some concern, I think, um, based on the conversation you and I had earlier today, about whether or not the Speedmaster professional itself could actually, you know, stand up to more prolonged use in outer space. Yeah, I, I mean, concern is probably a very, very, very strong word, but indeed, uh, uh, the, the engineer corps, uh, led by James Ragan. Not concerned time. so much, but you, you want to be sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Evidently. Uh, NASA wants to be sure, and evidently also we, because by that time, it was known to the world that the Speedmaster is flying in space. Um, and the thing is, the original Speedmaster tests were carried out uh, with a goal to achieve space flight and to, with a goal to achieve um, EVA, like regular, normal, uh, spacewalk activity right. and but NASA by 1968 knew already that Apollo 15 is coming they knew that the lunar rover is coming and they knew that the the EVAs on the moon will be longer and will be a bit more hard for a lot of equipment and so NASA needed to assure to assert themselves that also the watches would survive to fulfill that end uh, there was no deal, of course, but to fulfill that, um, today we can say uh, secretly, we tried to develop, to better even on the, sp on the Speedmaster to create the perfect space watch. And the result, the first result, was um, a watch that is today known as Alaska, Alaska Project. Here we talk about what we know as Alaska Project 1 or Alaska 1. And just to clarify uh, once and for all that the name Alaska has nothing to do with temperatures, has nothing to do with snow. Um, at the time, uh, Omega did code name its secret projects with two different ways. Um, we code named movement projects with birds. With birds. birds? Bird names. Uh, famously, I think collectors amongst us today will know the albatross, the chronoquartz. And it's called Albatross because, simply speaking, the movement, when it was developed secretly, it was the Project Albatross. And for, for full watches, we used at the time country names, city names, or state names. It could well have been the Project New York, or Project Paris, or Project anything else. It just happened to be Project Alaska. And the idea was, at the time, Bien was, still is, but was already watchmaking capital of the world. And... Um, the competition was there, American competition. Ah, so there were uh, uh, American companies, like, like uh, well, American companies that had presence in Bien, and there was some concern about uh, inadvertent technology transfer. Should we say? Yes, this you can this you can say even louder than this. Yeah. Um, and so the idea was, if we can confuse the the possible leakers, 
with false information. This is exactly what happened. It even confused that at some point. Um, so what you have with the Alaska one is an incredible advancement, advancement in technology because you have something that showcases Omega's pioneering spirit that was always present and is present until today, and you'll find some parallels. Now, Space Watch rule number one, if you like, protects the movement. How do you protect the movement? You protect it, you make it so that it protects itself. So the Calibre 861 inside this version of the Alaska project has all its vertical parts, all the pivots, made of a special alloy to make them more temperature resistant. And it also used a new, uh, new generation of oils to also make, to change the viscosity, okay? So you protect the movement by protecting it itself. And vertical parts, of this should ring a bell when you talk about today's Omega technology. It's a precursor of things to come. Second rule, protect the movement with a watch case. If you look at the shape of the Alaska one, case. It's cushion. It's a cushion shape. It's quite huge. It's uh, asymmetric as the moon watch case, but quite thick. And it's made of titanium. And this watch qualifies as one of the first, if not the first, chronographs of the whole world to be made in titanium. In 1968 and 69, because that's the timing of this watch, titanium, this is not your regular material. Yeah. Um, and we had to learn how to work it, actually, to make a watch case like this. Mm -hmm. And then, Rule number three, protect the dial, protect it from, the, from upstairs, like from the upper side. The white color was chosen after many, many tests in Zurich in a so-called space simulator because it's the color that was found that reflects heat and radiation better than instead of absorbing it. And the last and final protection is the one that most collectors know today, the outer case. Aluminum, red anodized oh, aluminum. I think once you see this, you never forget it. Yes. It's really, it's really amazing. And as a collector, it gave me a nightmare, of course, in my younger days, um, because I always wanted one. At least now I can touch it. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like the main concern with uh, developing the Alaska, it's a fascinating uh, story, by the way, about the, uh, uh, the naming conventions mm -hmm. for uh, movement development projects and for watch development projects. Um, so the, uh, it sounds like the main concern for the Alaska project was really uh, greater resistance to uh, extreme temperature variations mm -hmm. due to prolonged exposure uh, during uh, long, the longer EVAs that would be associated um, with uh, the later Apollo missions. Especially also on the lunar, lunar rover. On the lunar rover. Because if you, if you, if you take into account the, the extreme solar uh, exposure, which is unfiltered mm -hmm. for an EVA that goes l for longer than 30 minutes, and the astronaut that is not driving the rover, which is holding on the rail, like this. I mean, even though we talk about slow motion in brackets, still, with the heat and everything else, the watch has to endure incredible things. Mm -hmm. And mind you, I mean, even the Speedmaster, like the regular Speedmaster in the end endured it because this one didn't, didn't make it in the end to the moon. So everything that NASA was possibly a bit afraid didn't happen. Because in the end of the day, those long spacewalks, those long, long EVAs were carried out with regular production speedmasters. And that says a lot. So, <clears throat> you know, just to sort of sum up, we have uh, the 2998, which, uh, you know, again, represents those, you know, brave early days when uh, you just, you got the job done however you possibly could get it done with the best tool you could find. Um, we have the Gold Sparrow Agni, which sort of represents the high watermark of man's spaceflight, the achievement of the moon, uh, the ability to send uh, human astronauts into a, low Earth orbit, more or less at will. And then we have the, uh, the Alaska project, this wonderful uh, piece of engineering that represents a sort of extreme development of uh, the mechanical watch in particular, or in general, and the Speedmaster in particular, uh, for the most uh, grueling possible environments that it could be placed in, kind of a dream of a possible future for manned spaceflight. And it links also to, to, our, to the world of today, watchmaking today, and even the, the watchmaking of the future for us. So it's really an important watch because it's like, it's not the missing link, it's the link is there. Yeah. But if it wasn't there, it would have been the missing link. Well, that's three great stories, Petros. Thank you so much for bringing these uh, <coughs> watches in for us today to talk about um, and for us to find out some new things about their uh, history. It's, uh, there are a million Speedmaster stories and each one is better than the next, but thank you for sharing these three. You're more than welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All the best.
So Reynald here is, in fact, the president and CEO of Omega Worldwide. Uh, so I'm going to ask a question that I think actually many people would, would love to know. How does one get to be the president of Omega? <laughs> It's, it's, thank you for asking me this, this question. I think that uh, uh, for many people knowing me, and I've been called uh, when I was elected as a veteran uh, of, of Omega because I've spent 20 years of my, my career. In fact, uh, my whole career uh, as, a, as a, just after uh, writing the PhD it, with Omega. So it's, it's all about sharing what, what we could hear also from, from Petros. Uh, it's all sharing about the passion, the passion about, about that incredible brand. And just to, to talk about Speedmaster, I think that you know we have to, to come back also to some of the bad times, maybe uh, about the idea of, of one of the gentlemen that was long, long time before me that, that once in the, in the management committee decided to, to, to really to um, stop the production of this only reference, which was the Speedmaster Moonwatch. And that was at that time, uh, with the passion and with the vision of Mr. Hayek, um, um, totally, of course, not accepted by himself. So you see, this whole Omega, it's a magical brand, uh, Speedmaster even more so. So 20 years of Omega, uh, very much into sales and, and distribution having contributed like many of my colleagues worldwide about the success of who we are today and uh, and then and then having have being there at the at the right time and also sharing maybe some of the ideas for the future um, about how to bring this incredible traditional brand how to bring the magic into into even more success and 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 I'm very proud of 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 being the CEO of this company because I'm very proud of all the people that are working for me and for that brand all around the world we share the same passion and w were you aware of Omega as a child growing up? Yeah, I mean, what is very interesting is that uh, talking uh, now, hearing about uh, some of the stories that obviously know because uh, we've been pe spending a lot of time together with with Petros. Obviously, I mean, I've always been a very big fan of of of, of uh, Chronograph and Speedmaster. Always been one of the watch uh, uh, that I was always looking at uh, up because um, it's 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 if it's not the most iconic Chronograph, it's at least the most iconic watch Chronograph for me. And it's funny, you've, you've told me in the past that while collectors tend to gravitate towards Speedmaster, commercially the Seamaster and other lines are, are maybe even more successful? Yeah, I mean, it's also historically, you know, as, I, as, as I've said, you know, because Speedmaster was um, not longer than, than about 25 years ago, only one reference, and in the meantime, it's become so strong. And, 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 but it represents more than this whole tradition. You know, without tradition, without the DNA of a, of a collection, you can do any success. I'm truly, I'm truly very much believer in that, and Speedmaster is for me the I most iconic example of, of the success of Omega today because of this. We are, there's not one Speedmaster in our collection, even though we have many references, that is not a chronograph. I mean, this whole um, structure that we've been put in place for Speedmaster makes it into a big success. But of course, if I think about some of the marketing and communication successes of Omega, I have to talk about, you know, the Olympic Games, the testimonial, but obviously about James Bond, and, and the whole Seamaster line, which also represent the tradition and the innovation spirit. We've, uh, Petros talked about the pounding spirit of Omega. I think if, if you think about the 20s, the 30s, or, or later on, Seamaster always also been one of the most symbolic uh, uh, watch of our uh, brand that represented, you know, this whole diving, the whole technology about professional uh, watches. So obviously Seamaster with the lines we have, uh, with the celebration we have this year again, right. you know, uh, also uh, 60 years is basically also part of the DNA of the brand. And in the meantime, because of the James Bond campaign, because of the Planet Ocean uh, structure has become a, a bigger line than Speedmaster, yes. And so, so when you're deciding where to distribute budget, how do you say, okay, Speedmaster is for, for collectors and connoisseurs, and we've got these other lines that are really commercially driven. You have uh, the Olympics, mm. you have James Bond, you have you know, so Michael Phelps, Sidney uh. Crawford, amazing yeah. ambassadors. How do you decide what gets what, or which budget is, is allocated to where? Um, um, first of all, I mean, th there's one thing that is very important, and I see it even more today, and I've always been very much into in my career as a sales and retail guy. I mean, we are not a monoproduct brand. Right. I, mean, I mean, the magic about Omega is about having different lines. It's probably one of the most attractive brands in terms of a DNA each in each of the lines. So 
of course, we are also looking at the years. If it's an Olympic year, if there is a history about, about a line, then we are locating the goods. But somewhere, we are very passionate about all this. So um, that the year, finally, is very long. Yeah. And we are organizing ourselves in terms of renovating, rejuvena rejuvenating some brands, bringing into, uh, as for instance, the new Aquaterra coming to Basel with the whole master chronometer certification that we're going to bring into that line. But we are never, ever l leaving one of our children alone for the whole year. So it's very much about passion. It's very much about also topic. And as, as we were discussing before, um, there's, for instance, one incredible you know, um, heritage from the past, almost now, is the famous limited edition. And this year, of course, it's again a limited edition of Speedmaster. That is for us a very key element of our strategy, but it's maybe not always linked with a lot of uh, advertising, but a lot of passion about people and making events like tonight with collectors talking about maybe the already the next ones, uh, as this one of this year is already finished and, and quite of a, an attractive one, I have to admit. Also to the fact that um, it's a tribute to Jinsen, who was uh, not only the last man who was on the moon, but who was a tremendous ambassador, not only from Omega, but an ambassador of this whole um, incredible time of, of pioneering of, 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 of the whole uh, moon exp expedition. So I have, to, I have to say it's also something that anyway we would have done because we have lost a, a, true, a true friend. Yeah, and I, I think a watch that, that was really exciting to so many of us was the, the Speedy Tuesday limited mm -hmm. edition that you did with, with our friend Robert Jan mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. not so long ago. How did that project uh, come to be? Um, as, as, as I said, I mean, I mean, we have an iconic piece, which is Speedmaster, but we have also uh, the tradition. We have also, don't forget, this whole new world. At Omega, we're, we're quite a dynamic in terms of digital. You know, everybody talks about a lot about digital and all that, but I think that there's a, there's a way of, first of all, of knowing, of being coherent and consistent and, and getting to understand what are also the needs and what are the, the expectations. So the Speedy Tuesday for us, was like the perfect example of how to create the real watch, how to celebrate Speedmaster in its own DNA. Because Speedy Tuesday, for me, every Tuesday, this is a celebration of one watch, an iconic watch. Somehow, even further than the whole moon ex uh, expeditions, it's about the design, it's about some people that have this love, this passion, or that we like at Omega, that brought us some success. So, Speedy Tuesday, we had them uh, creating an event like today uh, in our offices, and then uh, speaking to Robert Jan and, 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 and to some of the people there that have so much of respect and, and, and love for that brand, we decided to create this in the way of Omega doing things with a perfect product, and I have to admit also the perfect way of talking to, to collectors and fans worldwide. And, and I'm, I'm very thrilled about the result, and I'm, I'm somewhere you know, very proud of this brand that is Speedmaster, because PD Tuesday, the watch, is for me the real example of the celebration of the, all this passion that people have for, 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 that, for that iconic model. Yeah. And this not only because it's an old vintage watch, because it's a very modern watch. This is the example that at Omega, we not only talk about the past, we are realizing it into the present with a lot, a lot of emotion, which it's very rare for a brand. Yeah. You know, Speedmaster is not only a watch that you can buy as a vintage. It has a lot of modernity yeah. and um, will continue to do so. I, I would say if, there, if there's one criticism I, I can hear from, from collectors, journalists, friends of the Speedmasters that there are so many limited editions. What, what will you continue to do over the next few years? And how do you kind of, you know, juxtapose mm. your strategy mm. versus another brand's mm. strategy mm -hmm. who also makes yeah. a nice chronograph mm. and there's only one model and there's only yeah. been one model for the last, uh, you know, 50 years or so? Let me, let me tell you that there, there, there is still the Speedmaster. We all know it and, and you can still have these iconic ones. There's a lot of inspiration around the limited edition uh, that we're doing every year. The inspiration is about the watch, 
Um, the watch that you get in a fantastic box with the whole story of, of the moon. And this is something that still today is the best seller of the line. So this is also very, for, very important for me to mention that that watch, the Speedmaster, is one of the most, not iconic, but most inspiring watches. Now to talk about the limited edition, I think that it's our tribute, our, our, our heritage uh, to that famous model and to the whole expeditions, you know, from the all the Apollos and Gemini. I think it's, it's part of our DNA to celebrate each year with a special model. Um, that exactly contribution that Omega has done um, to this still to be incredible um, um, moon, moon, moon uh, history. So from my, my understanding, I think that there's a lot of people that are interested by the limited edition that finally will buy the iconic watch and there is also a lot, a lot of success always around the limited edition because they're not just there with a small engraving on the back there's always a story about it there's always something that of course relates to the to the to the mission but still also make it a bit different if i think about uh, the very famous snoopy that that's that's not only a limited edition that's much more than this right. but don't forget that's talking about inspira in inspiration for some young people that don't know about this whole history and are suddenly being interested into our chronograph or even into watches, which for me, it's more than just talking about the limited edition.